welcome to Grand Rounds. Uh, Dr. Roman is um, out of town, so he asked me to um, do the honors of introducing our speaker this morning. I'm very happy to um, introduce one of our colleagues, which is always fun, I think, to, uh, when we have our own faculty that we can highlight. Um, Dr. Stephen Winters is very well known to all of us and has been chief of the Division of Endocrinology on our campus since 1999, and I realized he came shortly after I did, so I've uh, been here about the same amount of time. Um, Steve completed his undergraduate degree at Flushing University in New York, followed by medical school at the State University of New York Upstate Medical Center in Syracuse, followed by residency in internal medicine at Strong Memorial Hospital in Rochester, New York. He became a research fellow in endocrinology at the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development in Bethesda, and after completing his fellowship, he joined the faculty at the University of Pittsburgh, where he rose to the rank of professor. We were very fortunate to recruit him to the University of Louisville, where he's a valued faculty member here. Steve has served as a reviewer for multiple medical journals and has numerous publications and presentations to his credit. His primary research focus has been in male infertility, and he has been a mentor to numerous graduate students, as well as our own medical students and residents. We are very fortunate that he will be presenting today, today on a very timely and somewhat controversial topic, and I'm pleased to present Dr. Stephen Winters as our Grand Round Speaker, and the title of his talk will be The Vitamin D Conundrum, Is Vitamin D Deficiency a Significant Health Problem? Steve? So, uh, in keeping with sort of the format here, I thought I would introduce us a patient who we saw some time ago, who was a 64-year-old um, uh, black woman who was referred to us for hyperparathyroidism because she had a high level of parathyroid hormone. Uh, but unlike most people with primary hyperparathyroidism, the serum calcium level was not elevated. Uh, and in spite of that, her physicians had suggested that she should have uh, parathyroid surgery, and one of her doctors recognized that maybe it's time for another opinion. Uh, Eighteen years before, she had had bariatric surgery as a treatment for obesity with a ruin Y type of procedure. And when I saw her, she was weak, and she just couldn't stand up uh, from her seated position, uh, and she was still quite overweight. Uh, among the metabolic abnormalities was a low phosphate, uh, an elevated alkaline phosphatase, uh, and a very low level of vitamin D of 7 nanograms per deciliter. The 125-dihydroxy-D, on the other hand, was in the normal range, although at the lowest edge of normal. I decided that the primary problem was probably vitamin D deficiency, and I treated her with vitamin D. And I added some calcium to her diet uh, as L, uh, elemental calcium. And over several months, her <laughs> proximal muscle weakness improved, uh, and one year later, the biochemical abnormalities had all normalized. Uh, so uh, some of you may remember that maybe about 10 years ago, we had Dr. Michael Hollick, uh, who visited here. You may remember, those of you who are that old, that he is a very flamboyant man uh, and was very entertaining. Uh, and in fact, he's written about 500 papers, almost all of them about vitamin D, uh, and he is in part responsible uh, for this uh, vitamin D conundrum. At the time, you might remember, uh, Jeff, that he criticized the dermatologists for uh, uh, suggesting that we should not have any uh, sunlight exposure. Uh, and he did that because vitamin D is really made in the body uh, from sunlight. Yep. So over the years, uh, the interest in vitamin D is certainly uh, asymptotically increased, and last year there were almost uh, there were over 5,000 publications with a citation of, of vitamin D. You can imagine I didn't have time uh, to read all of them, and I'm certainly not really a true expert in, in this field for the lifelong career, but it's very interesting, uh, and as Barbara said, it's important to discuss. So not only are there many, many more papers to read, but there are many more tests being done. 
I couldn't find this kind of statistic for a U.S. population, but this is a statistic from primary care uh, clinics and pediatrics from the U.K., and these are the number of tests of vitamin D which have been done uh, in recent years, and there's a rise of more than tenfold over the past 10 years, and the amount of money being spent on vitamin D prescriptions has uh, similarly uh, increased. So uh, vitamin D is a uh, vitamin. It's an essential nutrient. It's required in limited amounts. But unlike most vitamins, it's really synthesized in the body and not really uh, a part of the uh, diet. Now, there are two forms of vitamin D. This is the first thing to learn. One is called D3, and the other is called D2. And the two forms of vitamin D uh, differ in the side chain, as shown here. Sadly, the guy who drew this very pretty picture got that mixed up, <laughs> and then he has the side chains exactly the same, so we'll ignore that. <laughs> but what happens is that 70-hydro uh, uh, cholesterol, which is primarily the product from the liver, is acted on by UV light from sunlight and made into uh, cholecalciferol D3. And then that cholecalciferol uh, circulates in the blood and goes to the liver, where it's hydroxylated almost constitutively so that the levels of vitamin D3 uh, are, are, are quite high in the nanograms per mil. What happens then is that the 25-hydroxy-D passes through the kidney where it's under control of regulation by a variety of hormones, and we produce the active form of vitamin D, 125-dihydroxy-D, which circulates in picogram amounts. Now, there's also the alternative D2, which is normally present in very, very small amounts. It is present in a liver and in fish oils, and it is the type of D which is fortified and added to milk, so that if your patient is being treated with D2, you're going to have both D2 and D3 uh, in, in the circulation. So what exactly happens? Uh, vitamin D... 125, the active form of vitamin D, influences the GI tract to increase calcium absorption, increases serum calcium, and in a typical endocrine kind of feedback mode, there are calcium receptors in the parathyroid gland. The calcium receptor then inhibits the transcription of the PTH gene and limits PTH secretion. This is where the drug Sinacalcet or Sensapar works. Many of you may use this. It activates, and this is like a co-receptor, for this action so that the serum calcium is more effective in suppressing PTH production. So the 125 production is regulated of IPTH, which regulates this in a negative feedback. So in the GI tract, there are these channel proteins, and the channel proteins are probably regulated by the vitamin D receptor, but there are other potential mechanisms. And the channel proteins then allow uh, calcium uh, to uh, enter from the uh, lumen, the dietary calcium, that is. Now, uh, in the last 10 years, there's a new player on the block, FGF23, fibroblast growth factor 23. And FGF23 is a protein which causes phosphaturia, and patients who have a type of mesenchymal tumor may present with isolated hypophosphatemia because of overproduction of this. Well, FGF23 is stimulated when the phosphate goes up and suppressed when the phosphate goes down. And of course, if you have poor absorption then of phosphate from the GI tract, you're going to get hypophosphatemia. You're going to increase, sorry, decrease the FGF23, which in of itself has an inhibitory effect on the production of 125, so that low phosphate predisposes to increase 125, and high phosphate, as in CKD, predisposes to an inhibition of this uh, uh, important product. So because of this per perfect regulation of the 125 production by parathyroid hormone, by phosphate, by FGF23, the active form is relatively maintained across all of the dietary uh, modalities. So here are the levels of 25-hydroxy-D, uh, 25 and these are very, very low values here. You don't see the value, but they're here. But you can see what's going on is that the level of 125 
is really maintained, even at very low levels, of 25. So that even though 125 is the active form, it's 25-hydroxy-D, which is really the marker for vitamin D deficiency. So here you can see, in part, how that occurs, because as 125 goes down, the PTH tends to rise, as I said a minute ago, and that's one of the factors that sustains the 125 production at low, low values. So uh, this is the way to show that 125 is the active form. This is what's called a radioreceptor assay. It was popular when I was a fellow, <laughs> and I did a lot of these in my, in my research training. And what happens is you take the receptor some way, either now a recombinant assay, but then a natural assay, uh, a natural source of the receptor, and you add a radio-labeled ligand to it, and you displace that ligand with various drugs or uh, natural compounds. So you can see that way to the left here, at the lowest concentrations, is the displacement curve for 125, showing that it's more than a thousand times more bioactive in terms of radioreceptor occupancy than is the 25. And this is the way companies sort of screen potential drugs uh, as vitamin D analogs using these types of methods. So uh, vitamin D is a type of steroid hormone. And like other steroid hormones, it functions as a transcription factor. It enters the cell and goes to the nucleus and binds to the promoter of a variety of genes. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of genes have been shown to be regulated by uh, vitamin D. Interestingly, the vitamin D binds not as a homodimer, but as a heterodimer, together with a partner uh, trans a transcription factor known as RXR. And between these, when they activate genes, they have not only the biological effects on calcium and PTH that I showed you before, but there's a wide variety of effects on cell proliferation, apoptosis, differentiation, inflammation, regulation, and all of this has led to the idea that there are multiple extraskeletal manifestations and functions of vitamin D. So when patients are deficient in vitamin D in childhood, it's called rickets, and when patients are deficient in adulthood, it's called osteomalacia. So I don't know how well this shows, but this is the distal uh, part of the uh, wrist. Uh, and these bones here, there's a big dark area, and then a very poorly defined area here. This is unmineralized osteoid. So you need the uh, vitamin D and phosphate uh, to a mineralized bone. Uh, and when you're severely vitamin D deficient in, in childhood, you don't mineralize the bone. So what happens in the setting of a patient who has rickets due to vitamin D deficiency is that the vitamin D level goes down. I showed you that there's a stimulation of 125, so you'd miss the diagnosis if you measured the 125. And that results in a low serum calcium, and the serum calcium increases the PTH. The PTH increases the alkaline phosphatase, and uh, very often, in part due to the low phosphate, uh, the FTF23 is low. So if you're a child with rickets whose growing bones are not developing normally, you might have this, genuvalentin. Uh, and you might have this. I hope you can see that. These are little bumps in the edges of the ribs. This is called the rachitic rosary. So uh, in adulthood, we have the same kind of biochemical problems, but we rarely get those uh, clinical findings. Uh, instead, what we get is fractures. And the way you might identify patients with osteomalacia and distinguish them from the much more common osteoporosis is that overall, all of the blood tests in osteoporosis patients are OK. The only exception nowadays is the prevalence of vitamin D deficiency. Uh, which we'll talk about uh, later. But the PTH, the alkaline phosphatase, the excretion of calcium in the urine, those things are all within the normal range in the involutional or senile osteoporosis patient. And they contrast with these findings, which are just like you might find in rickets. So what do the bones look like in a patient with osteomalacia? Again, I hope you can see this. Here is a, a proximal femur. You can see the thickness of the cortex versus a normal person. The thickness of the distal radius versus a normal person. 
antecedent to the clavicle versus the antecedent knee is different than the loss of bone mass in the spine, which categorizes uh, osteoporosis. And that's because the cortical bone here is the type of bone that has to be mineralized. And if the mineralization uh, isn't working right, you have less than the normal amounts of cortical bone, and you're susceptible to fracture. Now, what exactly is vitamin D deficiency? This is one of the big conundrums, because the experts, which is not me, <laughs> cannot agree. So there's the Institute of Medicine, a very uh, well-known, uh, important uh, body, investigative body, and the Endocrine Society, which includes Dr. Hollick, is one of the main members. And you can see that they are much more liberal uh, in their definition. So they say that anyone is, has less than 20 nanograms per mil of 25-hydroxy-D is vitamin D deficient, whereas the Institute of Medicine feels that the right value is 12. In addition, there's this intermediate insufficient group, 12 to 20 or 20 to 30. And then there's the issue of what exactly is normal. And they feel it's 20, they feel it's 30, and they feel there's no added benefit for treating anyone whose value uh, is um, below 30. So one of the other problems that you encounter is that just like any complicated system, the different assays in different laboratories from different manufacturers don't always give you the same result. So the College of American Pathologists sends out a whole group of samples to various laboratories who use different methods to measure 25-hydroxy-D, uh, and they ask them, what is your result? And the average result is going to be here at zero. And then they take all the different methods, and they look at the 5% above and 5% below, because every, every method can have a 10% error, five, plus or minus 5%. And you can see that many of the assays perform reasonably well. That they, These are all the same samples now. Many of the assays perform reasonably well, and that they give you results which are right around the zero line. But you can see there are plenty of assays that aren't. Whoa. All right. So there are many assays that read very low, but quite a substantial amount. There are assays which read high. And the reason is this is because if they're trying to measure total 25 hydroxy D, you have to identify 20, one, you have to identify vitamin D2, and you have to identify vitamin D3. Now, under normal circumstances, most of what's in the plasma is uh, D3. But if you're taking D2, then you have both. Well, what if your standards or your antibody don't recognize D2 and D3 exactly the same? You can see that you're not exactly going to come up with the same result. So um, many uh, st uh, steroids now are being uh, measured by liquid chromatography and mass spectroscopy. Estradiol levels in women, we would always measure them by immunoassays, and most of the uh, results have been junk because the, after the menopause, women have very low values, and we really were never able to distinguish the blank from a real value. Now, with assays like this, which can identify hormones with a, a concentration of one picogram or two picograms per mil, many, many, many researchers and ultimately clinical uh, uses are switching over to LCMS. So this is based on a size, a column, and then a separation by uh, size and charge by mass spectroscopy, and you get a peak. And the height of the peak then is, because you know exactly where it's coming off, is the amount of the hormone. So here you can see all of this is D3. And this little tiny little bit here is D2. This is a normal individual. This is a report from Quest Diagnostics. Uh, in years past, uh, until maybe this year, most of our Quest diagnostic reports were like this, and they were done by LCMS, and they gave you a total, and then they broke it down by D3 and D2. I got many consults because, dear Dr. Winters, my patient has a very low level of D2. What should I do? Well, that's normal. But now, most of what we're getting from Quest is the, is the immunoassay, and all they're giving us is the 
total. And I never really called them. I assume it's financial because this is very expensive. And I showed you how many tests are being done. So I assume it's something like that. But I honestly don't know. OK. So um, this slide. This slide shows the relationship between 25-hydroxy-D uh, and parathyroid So to define what's normal, you might say, ah, one of the actions of 25-hydroxy-D is to maintain parathyroid hormone in the normal range. So that the normal result would be the concentration which suppressed elevated levels of TTH. So that's what you have here. You have elevated levels of TTH versus 25-hydroxy-D, and here's 25 to 29. And you can see when the individual hit 30 the, and above, the TTH is relatively uh, stable. So this is the type of uh, result that uh, sort of supports the endocrine society contention that if you're a little bit below 30, your TTH is going up. Not a whole lot, but it's going up. And therefore, 30 is normal. And this is just the prevalence of high values. It's the same thing here. So you can see that once you get to 30, the prevalence of high values is sustained. And as you get below 30, you're more and more likely uh, to have high values. Now, what if you look at the real data? <laughs> That's just an average, a smooth curve. This is what you really find. These are individuals. Uh, and here are the ones who are below above 20. And 40% of the uh, patients in this study of under 40 men uh, and under 40 women between age 60 and 90 uh, were above 20 and 60% below 20. But you can see what happens is that many patients read the book and that even though they have a low vitamin D, they have a high TTH. And many patients didn't read the book. And despite having a low uh, vitamin D, their TTH is okay. So where are we with this? Now, what are among the factors? If you divide the patients by age and compare older people and younger people, you can see the same type of a curve. Uh, you can see really that in the younger people, the increase doesn't seem to go too much elevate until we get below 10. Uh, in the older individuals, it sort of rises more rapidly. And this may have to do with the effect of aging on renal function and, and phosphate and its impact on TTH or other factors. Among the other factors are exposure to sunlight, like we talked about earlier. So among the people who get uh, low uh, vitamin D are patients who don't have a lot of exposure to sunlight. And we'll see some of these patients. They come through our uh, refugee clinic. I've seen a few patients uh, just like this uh, already. Uh, another group are the institutionalized, either the institutionalized elderly uh, or the institutionalized young adults with all sorts of intellectual and physical disabilities. Uh, and luckily, uh, the uh, administration of the nursing home where uh, these people live recognized the problem. And here you can see them out uh, in the park uh, enjoying their sunlight <laughs> and having lots of sunshine uh, on their body. Now, here's a uh, study that looked at a group of uh, women uh, like that who were uh, from uh, the Middle East uh, and uh, Southeast Asia, in South Asia who had just uh, delivered a baby. Uh, and they were looking at the uh, unique aspects of vitamin D and calcium metabolism as they returned to pregnancy because during pregnancy, all the calcium that's going into the make the baby's bones comes from mom. So uh, understanding vitamin D metabolism in pregnancy is a big field in of itself. Uh, and uh, what they did here is uh, look at the women uh, and measure uh, their 25-hydroxy-D, uh, uh, TTH, uh, and ask them uh, about pain in various sites, like bone pain, uh, and joint pain, et cetera, et cetera. And they rated on a scale. And then they asked them to stand up 10 times from the seat of chair, a measure of proximal muscle pain. That's, you know, when you're examining it. And then what they did, it's just an open label study. They treated the patients uh, for uh, three months. 
advocacy that the level of your vitamin D increase quite substantially. So that parathyroid hormone levels fell. Uh, the uh, pain score declined uh, and uh, shared standing was done uh, more rapidly. Uh, and this part, of course, reminds me about the connection between vitamin D deficiency and fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia is one of those dis puzzling disorders, and many of the patients with fibromyalgia have low vitamin D, uh, and many of them have uh, decreased in pain score. So here we see the uh, part about the weakness. Uh, and uh, what they have here is a measure of sarcopenia. Uh, and their assessment of sarcopenia was, did the patient have a low lean body mass? And what was their grip strength? And between those two parameters, they came up with a uh, sarcopenia score. Uh, and the sarcopenia score is shown here uh, uh, transformed with the uh, patients having the highest levels of vitamin D having a score of uh, one, uh, and the uh, uh, patients with the lower values having higher scores. So you can see the relationship is inverse. The lower your vitamin D, uh, the more uh, abnormal is your sarcopenia score. And then they controlled it because there are all sorts of covariates that epidemiologists like to put into their equation. And after they did that, uh, the uh, significance remained. Now, another way to say what is the right level of vitamin D is to look at how much calcium you absorb from the GI tract. So if the main function of the 125-hydroxy-D is to increase calcium absorption, you would think that there's a nice cut point uh, with the people having low values being below the cut point and the people having high values uh, being above the cut point. Uh, and the way they do this is they give you a little calcium drink which contains a little bit of uh, calcium-45, which you can count, uh, 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 I think, in the urine uh, after the patient uh, drinks the, the mixture. And you can see, however, that there's a uh, continuous relationship between 125, 425-hydroxy-D and calcium absorption. There's really no cut point at all. Maybe you'd think that low vitamin D then would be associated with a low bone mass, and the patients with a low bone mass would be the ones who have low vitamin D. So these are patients with osteoporosis. So these are the uh, peak scores here. So zero would be a, a normal score for age. So because of osteoporosis, they have low scores. But you can see that there's really no relationship between the peak score uh, and in the uh, spine or uh, in the femoral neck uh, and the level of 25 hydroxy D. Now, because of the connection between sunlight, uh, another uh, pitfall in analyzing uh, vitamin D is when do you measure it with respect to the seasons. So as it turns out, uh, this is Melbourne, Australia, uh, and this has been found in many other populations, that over the summer we have sunlight exposure and we have less uh, exposure during the winter hours. And therefore, there's a quite a dramatic, maybe, you know, 15% uh, increase in the vitamin D level as the summer progresses with the highest levels in the early autumn. And that parathyroid hormone levels are inversely related to 25-hydroxy-D uh, over time. Another group of individuals who uh, might get vitamin D deficiency are the patients I described, the patient with the malabsorption syndrome. She's had some of her GI tract uh, removed, and therefore she's calcium and phosphate and vitamin D deficient. But defining whether these people have vitamin D deficiency is also dependent on when you draw the blood sample. So these are a bunch of different studies, uh, and so uh, meta-analysis, if you will, and they all have different cut points for deciding what's low, in their opinion. But overall, you can see that the chance of having a low value is much higher in the winter than in the summer uh, and in every season. Uh, 
Uh, here is the same thing, the impact of uh, season on measuring the hormone levels. Now people living in Toronto uh, and comparing uh, Europeans with South Asians and East Asians. So you can see in fact, part because of skin color or clothing, those individuals have uh, lower values than the uh, European Caucasians. Uh, and uh, in the fall, the levels are higher than the winter. It's interesting to see that the slope seems to be greater uh, in the uh, Europeans than in this group, perhaps because they have more to follow. So uh, in our uh, patient population here in Louisville, we have a lot of African Americans, uh, and they too have uh, dark skin. Uh, and uh, you can see the distribution of vitamin D levels in people who are African American, black uh, versus uh, white, with the whites having a substantially higher uh, median level uh, than the blacks, and the prevalence of vitamin D deficiency being substantially higher in African Americans and Caucasians. Now, why should obesity uh, have uh, uh, an impact on vitamin D is one of the interesting, uh, un unexplained uh, uh, parts of the story. Uh, and here are the baseline values for uh, uh, normal weight and obese individuals, so they're less. And what happened here, uh, Bias and Pollock uh, and his uh, colleagues, uh, Jacob Erskine, uh, and what they did is make the vitamin D in two ways. They stimulated it using a phototherapy unit to make it from the skin, and they gave uh, vitamin D as an oral uh, uh, pill. Uh, and you can see that when you uh, br stimulated the values, that the difference between the normal weight and the overweight was even more dramatic uh, than uh, at baseline. And you can see that seasonal variations can uh, influence how we view the skin levels in obesity as well. So here are uh, the levels of normal weight individuals, overweight individuals, and obese individuals uh, in the fall, spring, uh, and here is the winter. So you can see at the highest time when the values are stimulated, the difference between normal uh, and overweight and obese is quite pronounced. But during the winter, the normal individuals tend to decline quite substantially, uh, and uh, the difference among the groups uh, disappears. So in the obese individuals, it's been suggested that why the values are low is that vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin, and it gets sequestered in the fat. But that's what you read in the textbook. It seems to me still a little bit of a hypothesis. Now, uh, some years ago, uh, one of our fellows, Dr. Chenna Batla, was interested in vitamin D, and we went to the ULH uh, emergency room uh, and uh, got uh, all of the blood samples from ladies uh, being checked in. Uh, and after the blood samples were run uh, in the chemistry lab, uh, we uh, took the discard together with Jim Miller, the late Jim Miller. Uh, and we analyzed, we were really looking at vitamin D binding protein, but here you can see uh, we have uh, African Americans and Caucasians, and we've separated them into thin and overweight, uh, and among the African Americans, um, the thin individuals have much lower values than the Caucasians, uh, but the uh, overweight individuals have relatively similar values uh, and as the Caucasians. The Caucasians. And that's shown here in our scattergram. We only had about 100 patients. There are other studies like this, which have 1,000 patients subsequent to ours, because studying vitamin D in African Americans is very important because uh, their increased bone mass, uh, despite the fact that they have low levels of vitamin D, people are trying to figure out why that is. So another uh, mechanism that influences how the individuals are responding to artificial sunlight is age. Remember I showed you that uh, aging is one factor which influences the relationship between vitamin D and parathyroid hormone. Well, aging too is important in how uh, the body increases the vitamin D level uh, after this sunlight exposure. So why exactly older individuals get a smaller <coughs> increment uh, and uh, uh, vitamin D than younger individuals, uh, not clear. So one group of patients, just like ours, who had uh, 
vitamin d deficiency is quite common are people with various gastrointestinal problems who have inflammation of their gi tract wall or they just don't have as much gi tract as they used to and you can see how common the likelihood of vitamin d deficiency is up as much as 63 percent i think that's a high 65 percent had a value of less than 15 nanograms per mil ulcerative colitis are the same small bowel resections and a short bowel procedure now so far we've been talking about total levels of vitamin d in the blood so as it turns out vitamin d circulates in the blood down to a protein it's called vitamin d binding protein and to do the assay they strip the vitamin d from the protein and measure the total vitamin d now everyone's familiar with free t4 some of you might be familiar with free testosterone we have uh assays for free hormones because the information from the total assay the assay of the total hormone may not always be exactly accurate and such is the same with vitamin d binding protein and vitamin d and free vitamin d but we're really only starting to see a few papers in the literature about free vitamin d and we don't really have yet any commercial assays that i'm aware of that measure free vitamin d and people have found that this vitamin d protein is important in how the vitamin d activates these alternative pathways i told you about the relationship between vitamin d deficiency and immune disorders cancers et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that may have something to do with the vitamin D by protein, as well as the impact of the vitamin D by protein on the measured <coughs> level. So uh, two uh, populations who might have and do have an abnormal vitamin D binding protein are people with liver disease, because vitamin D binding protein is made in the liver, uh, and uh, women who are pregnant, because estrogens markedly increase the production of vitamin D. So you can see that here in comparison to the control group. Here's the very low values in the liver disease patients and the very high values in the pregnant women. And not surprisingly, the total of vitamin D is very, very low in the liver disease patients. But if you alternatively assess vitamin D by one of these alternative methods, a direct free 25-hydroxy-D assay, which in of itself is not entirely uh, uh, adopted by all, or calculate the free 25 from the amount of the binding protein and the total uh, vitamin D and enter some affinity constants into the calculation, you wind up with normal values for people with liver disease. And on the other hand, uh, women who are pregnant who have a high vitamin D binding protein, if you do the same thing, their value is okay if you're monitoring them over the course of the total, with a total assay, but they're not so okay if you're using the alternative assay. And how all this plays out, I think it'll take time to know. So I mentioned before that there are these uh, extra uh, musculoskeletal they're in the cardiovascular system. They're in the uh, uh, salivary glands. They're in the reproductive tissue, immune cells, in the lungs, uh, in the skin, in the brain, uh, etc. So if there are vitamin D receptors in these tissues and there are target genes which are activated in vitro when you study these tissues, no doubt there's some biology. And uh, you can think about it this way, whereas the 25 hydroxy 25-hydroxy-D in the circulation is active, is uh, activated into 125 by the effect of parathyroid hormone, phosphate, uh, FTF23, and has these sort of traditional uh, actions that we've been talking about. But what it appears to happen is that these cells in these tissues also have a uh, 25-hydroxy-D1 hydroxylase. And many of you may know that uh, 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 lymphocytes and granulomatous cells make that enzyme because that's why patients with sarcoidosis get hypercalcemia. 
So maybe the enzyme in all of these tissues really is biologically important under physiological circumstances as well as the pathology. And these are called sort of paracrine actions. So this, what happens then is that the 25 hydroxy in the circulation gets converted to 125 in all of these tissues, which then has biological effects, perhaps related to the vitamin D binding protein. Now, many, 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 many disorders have been associated with low vitamin D. I've only listed a few of them here, and they account for many of those 5,000 papers that I showed you were published in 2016, much more than I can understand or talk with you about. Uh, and probably everyone here uh, in the audience can connect with someone <laughs> who has one of these disorders or has a specialty which uh, includes these disorders. So I just uh, highlighted a couple of disorders uh, for you. Uh, of course, diabetes, because I'm an endocrinologist. So uh, this is a prospective study. And what they did here in 1989 to 90 is get a blood sample from a large group of women. And they just followed them. Uh, and at baseline, they eliminated the ones who had diabetes. And they looked to see who developed diabetes. Uh, and what they did then is take the group and divide them by uh, quartiles into the vitamin D level. And they looked to see what was the likelihood of developing diabetes, depending on where you started out with the vitamin D. So the group with the lowest level uh, is, in this case, the reference group. And their risk for diabetes is one. And you can see that the higher your diabetes, or the higher your vitamin D level, the lower your risk for diabetes, quite a lot, down to one third. <laughs> Now, I showed you before how vitamin D is low in obesity. And of course, the first thing you'll tell me is that obese individuals uh, have high risk of diabetes. So this doesn't mean anything. So of course, epidemiologists know that. And they do this, again, with multivariate regularization. And they control for all of these other alternative uh, covariates. And you can see that the, 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 the risk changes and that the intermediate groups really aren't very much different than the low group. But still, the ones with the very highest value uh, have twice as much, uh, half as much diabetes as the, the people who had a value uh, of less than 20 nanograms, less than 17.6. So there's also been a connection between uh, vitamin D deficiency and the development of multiple sclerosis. What, what researchers reported is that patients who present with multiple sclerosis have lower levels of vitamin D uh, than uh, control. And this seems to be very true when the patients present in the summer months and early fall, uh, but seems to disappear uh, in uh, the uh, winter months. So you can see what happens is that the control individuals have much higher values of vitamin D by season but the patients with uh, multiple sclerosis do not. So why that might be and why low vitamin D might be present in uh, much more commonly in multiple sclerosis patients diagnosed in the summer remains to be determined. Here is the connection uh, between uh, sleep apnea and vitamin D. Of course, sleep apnea patients are overweight, hypertensive, often have kidney disease and diabetes. So there's lots of covariance. But nevertheless, if you look at the vitamin D level, this is some severity uh, statistic for um, uh, sleep apnea. The values are lower. AHI, I'm pretty sure, is a value that the sleep people use for assessing uh, uh, hypoventilation during the sleep study. And you can see that it's not perfect. <laughs> that there are people who have low values uh, who have very little hypoventilation. But overall, uh, the uh, correlation is significantly significant. Uh, here you have the heart rate uh, during the sleep study, I suspect. Uh, and you can see that the heart rate is faster uh, in the individuals with the lower vitamin D. Uh, and here it just shows you in this group, just like other groups, the amount of the uh, For our infectious disease uh, colleagues, this is a group of patients at the Brigham and Women's or Massachusetts General Hospital who had vitamin D levels measured. I suspect they were in their clinics. And they were admitted to the hospital over the next year with uh, C. diff. And here they've plotted uh, the risk for developing uh, C. diff 
versus the 25 they got to do from the preceding uh, clinic visit example. So you can see that below 40 here is quite an impressive um, increase in the risk uh, for developing uh, C. diff. And this is for oncology. Uh, this is the risk of dying if you have uh, breast cancer. Many of you will be familiar with this kind of plot. It's called a forest plot. And you use it for uh, analyzing uh, uh, results like this, uh, mul uh, multiple analyses like this. Uh, and what there are, are a whole group of different studies. And they plot the relative risk, uh, in this case, with the highest D and the lowest D. So there's usually a table like this uh, as part of it. And when the relative risk crosses one, these are the, this is the relative risk here, and this is the confidence limits. When the confidence limits cross one, then it's not a significant relationship. But when the confidence limits are all on one side of this one line here, the relationships are solid statistically. And you can see that three out of the four studies which look at uh, breast cancer um, patient mortality found that the mortality was lower uh, in individuals with higher levels of vitamin D. The same type of uh, analysis could be done uh, in, uh, for depression. So these are individuals followed for, These are individuals followed for depression. And blood samples are taken at time zero. And the risk of uh, developing uh, uh, depression is shown here. And you can see that the likelihood of developing uh, depression is much higher. Uh, and this is the CEDD4 type of depression uh, analysis. It's much higher uh, than individuals that are just Ignoring vitamin D. And finally, mortality. These are individuals who uh, had their blood samples uh, obtained and then their all cause mortality was tracked over uh, eight years of follow up. And it's called the uh, Health ABC study. And again, they divide the individuals into uh, quartiles for vitamin D levels. So these are the number of individuals who had this value. You can see there's a uh, very large number, almost a third or a half, have values that are below 20. And here you have the mortality. So the highest vitamin D group uh, have the uh, lowest mortality. And then when they do all of the covariates and all of that, you can see that the risk of the lowest group is attenuated some, but still, the lower your vitamin D level, the higher your risk of dying. So. Despite these many, many published studies, which are very provocative, with hundreds of reviews and meta-analysis, it's still uncertain if supplementing in an individual with vitamin D really has positive health effects, except for the muscles and bones, like I showed you uh, before. So let's just look at a few of those studies. Uh, these are COPD patients uh, who have a low uh, level of vitamin D at the outset. Uh, and uh, the baseline is 17.6 nanograms per mil, and they're given 1,200 units of vitamin D3 uh, for six months, and the individuals track their BMI, their FEV1, uh, their hand grip strength, the chair span, and their six-minute walk time, uh, and you can see that other than increasing the vitamin D level, so this is an amount that was increased, so the placebo group went up a little, the vitamin D group went up a lot. None of the other descriptors really was significantly different. And this is just a meta-analysis for diabetes. This is a group of studies of various types in this meta-analysis. It gave the patients vitamin D, uh, and they looked at glycemic control. And the vast majority in this forest plot overlapped the one line, but a few did not. And therefore, it's a little tantalizing to think that replacement of vitamin D patients is uh, useful and helpful. Uh, <coughs> the changes aren't huge, 
uh, but at least some studies came to that conclusion. Here are other uh, meta-analysis in this Lancet uh, publication for myocardial infarction, uh, for stroke, and for cancer, all of which are various studies where the patients were given vitamin D and various uh, outcomes of myocardial infarction, stroke, and cancer. They're all a little bit different. None of them are statistically significant. And uh, if you look at uh, clinicaltrials.gov, there's lots and lots of uh, trials of vitamin D uh, replacement gone going now. We have enough more studies of sleep apnea, leg cramps, high blood pressure, autism, uh, and uh, sleep apnea are among the studies that uh, investigators are conducting with funding, I hope. So why are the associations between vitamin D deficiency and non-muscular skeletal diseases not supported by the results of clinical trials? Well, maybe associations don't equal causality. But maybe the patients with mild disease are being included too much in the trials. Maybe the patients already have two advanced disease and the treatment must be initiated much sooner. And maybe the doses and the way they're giving it is not exactly right. Maybe tracking free vitamin D rather than total vitamin D may be a better way to know how much to give a patient. So when do you measure vitamin D? The first thing in bold here is there is no need to screen the general population. But who might be at risk? People who are at risk who you think have rickets or osteomalacia, obviously. Older adults with low bone mass, either osteoporosis or not. Patients with kidney disease, those who have transplants, or those who are having a worsening uh, renal failure. Patients after bariatric surgery, such as my patient. Patient with a variety of malabsorption syndromes, not surprisingly. Patients who have various clinical findings where a vitamin D deficiency might be prevalent, proximal muscle weakness of unknown etiology, for example. Uh, and those in whom you measure the serum calcium and phosphorus, and they're not exactly right, and you're trying to figure out what's going on. So in conclusion, measure 25-hydroxy-D, not the active form 125-hydroxy-D, to assess nutritional status. Most of the vitamin D is going to be 25-hydroxy-D3, so don't get excited if your patient has a very low level of D2. The assay results include both when we measure the total. And remember that not every lab is going to give you the same result. Corrected measure has proved to be difficult. And there are many, many caveats and co-founders. Caesar, for example. There are many, many associations between D levels and non-skeletal clinical conditions but the cause and effect relationships between these remain controversial and unclear. Thanks.
don't want to be given 50,000 to any of the teachers and faculty on the spectrum to get them. So we don't have to do this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, those assays are still in development. People argue about the accuracy, like 
both the direct assay and the calculated assay. So the concept is there, but the assay which has been proven to be accurate is not there. Okay, thank you. Is there any other questions? Thank you very much.